Hello there, and welcome to today's webcast, Improving Government Operations During and After COVID-19. This is Otto Dahl, a senior fellow at the Center for Digital Government, and I'm excited to serve as the host for today's webcast. Thanks for joining us. We are going to have a great session over the next hour. Before we dive into the content, I wanted to share a few brief housing, housekeeping notes. We will email a recording of this presentation to all the registrants within 48 hours. Please use the recording for your reference or feel free to pass along to colleagues. We have designed this webcast to be interactive and you can participate in Q&A with us by submitting your questions using the Q&A box at the bottom left of the presentation panel. Send in your questions as they come up throughout the presentation, and we will address as many of them as possible during the webinar today. For those of you interested in downloading a copy of the slides, you can do so by clicking the webinar resources widget at the bottom of the console. Also during today's webcast, you will be able to connect with your peers via LinkedIn and Twitter. For those of you on Twitter, please use hashtag GovTechLive to share key takeaways, quotes, and learnings from today's webcast. At the close of the webcast, we encourage you to complete a brief survey about the presentation. We would like to hear what you think. If you are unable to stay with us for the entire webcast, but would like to complete the survey, simply click the survey widget at the bottom of the screen to launch the survey. Otherwise, it will automatically pop up as soon as the webcast concludes. At this time, we recommend you disable your pop-up blockers, and if you are experiencing any media player issues or have any other technical problems, please visit our webcast help guide by clicking on the help button at the bottom of the console. Joining me today to discuss this topic are Chris Phillips and Luke Anderson. Chris Phillips is the Development Services Director for the city of Mount Vernon, Washington. Chris served 30 years in the United States Navy where he attained the rank of captain. His last assignment was leading a diverse staff of over 9,000 sailors, 2,000 departments of Navy civilians, and numerous contractors in the day-to-day -day operations for the Naval Air Station, Whidbey Island. From 2014 to 2016, he served as the Mokilto, Washington City Administrator and currently serves as the Mount Vernon, Washington Development Services and Facility Director. Chris has over 25 years of experience in facility maintenance management. Luke Anderson is the Enterprise Solutions Consultant at Dude Solutions. Luke comes from a background in energy automation and HVAC controls and has been with Dude Solutions over five years. He serves as president of his HOA board where he has proudly only been sued once. Luke and his wife, Alex, love to travel, especially with their dog, Roscoe. Luke's current role as enterprise solutions consultant allows him to consult with leaders of communities across the country to help them manage safe, efficient, and clean buildings and infrastructure. And so without further ado, I'm going to turn over the proceedings to Luke Anderson. Uh, all yours, Luke. All right. I appreciate it, Otto. Welcome, everybody. And uh, I realize I, I need to update my uh, my little factoid there with you guys. I, uh, I had a baby last year, and our traveling has ground to a halt. Um, so that's no longer our favorite thing to do. But anyway, on topic here, um, I'm, I'm glad Chris is here. I've got some great questions for Chris that we're going to go through. I've got some content in terms of some of the best practices that we've identified across the country. Um, so we're going to leave a little bit of time at the end for everybody to have uh, Q&A. So if you do have any questions, use that Q&A that was mentioned and submit it. Um, we will go through each question and uh, have Chris address them. If I have anything to add, I will. Um, but, you know, everybody's here for pretty much the same reason. Um, it, it changes based on your department, based on what your role is, but essentially COVID, Corona, whatever you want to call it, it has changed everything. Um, you know, if I, if I look at my own personal life, um, my wife is now working full-time at home for her law firm. I've got a kid who's home full-time at home because daycare is closed. 
and myself am working full time from home. Um, it's been an absolute zoo. New technology, we're using new processes, we've got all sorts of things that have changed. Um, the technology itself is, is what, what is we're focusing on, right? What technology are we using? How are we adapting to things that we've already had? How are we bringing in new technology to start to kind of handle this quote unquote new normal, right? The, that term that's been thrown around way too much over the past three months, but it's a real thing. Um, this isn't, this isn't, uh, uh, this isn't temporary. This isn't something that's going away tomorrow. So just to kick us off, um, I'd like everybody to, if you don't mind, just give us a click here. Take this little poll. Where, where are you at in your municipality for your department? Um, I'll leave this up for a couple of seconds and I'll share the results so we can kind of get an idea of where everybody's head's at. And, uh, and then we'll jump in and, uh, and start the Q&A. So hopefully if everybody's had a chance, just how, how busy are you? Is the business as normal? Have you suspended? What's, what's been the impact of COVID? Busier than ever. I'm glad that's the answer, Chris, because if it was we had no impact, we wouldn't have a lot to talk about today. <laughs> that's, but, that's um, true. <laughs> So I, Chris already had a great intro. Um, the one thing I want to I want to just kind of focus on is is Chris's service. We appreciate everything you did at the uh, at the Naval Academy and and preparing and doing it as an officer. Um, but let's uh, if you don't have anything from your perspective, Chris, I'll give you the floor for a minute. But otherwise, we can jump right into the Q and A. All right, on. So one of the things that I just wanted to share is that again, you know, the uh, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. Um, you know, it's about the team. So although I am the representative here, uh, there are 20 odd folks that uh, work with me on a day-to-day -day basis that really helped us create uh, the, the plan and uh, the execution that we have now. So uh, just wanted to make sure I, I start with that. It is, it is about the team. It is about serving. Um, and I, I saw as far as the attendees, you know, we've got groups from higher education, uh, a few municipalities, uh, large counties, states. Uh, so just a shout out to my friends uh, there in Maryland from Baltimore. I'm originally from South Baltimore, and uh, again, good to see uh, good representation across the uh, across the country participating today. That's awesome. Yeah, and and I think you, you hit the nail on the head. And let's let's kind of start right there. So when you when you talk about what your team did, you know the changes your team had to go through. Um, what was the biggest challenge that you had when you start? And then of those kind of challenges you, you, you addressed, how did you go about your process of kind of prioritizing those? Sure. So um, what we did uh, was probably two years ago, uh, again, with my background in, in the military and some emergency management type uh, issues, crisis management type uh, activities, uh, when I first got on board here, it was about a, a three-month assessing what was uh, what was going on, what was the state of not only our facility maintenance management, but also our, our permitting department. And there were a few things that uh, I sat down with our team and, and, and we talked about. Um, I've also got a background in Lean Six Sigma, so I've got uh, dry erase boards and a lot of uh, different color stickies uh, all around my office as we were, we were going around talking about process improvement, um, where we saw value uh, with our current structure, uh, where were areas that we could possibly look at changing. And that's where we went from a very cumbersome, paper-centric system as it related to um, maintenance and our permitting. Everything was done uh, either via some type of a paper uh, background, uh, email, uh, nothing PDF fillable. I mean, think, uh, think the worst of the worst and then take it down a notch or two, that's kind of where we were. And uh, what we saw was that we needed to automate. We needed to automate not necessarily to uh, trim employees. That was one of the things I needed to go ahead and ensure that uh, that was conveyed was that we were looking for process improvement. How do we make you better? Um, again, uh, one of my mantras from back in the military was just train staff and equip. You know, so what could we do to train better so that we were more effective and efficient in the end? And what that really started with was planning for some type of act of God. Um, you know, it could have been a snowstorm, earthquake, tsunami, you, you name it. I mean, you know, we all got it, uh, different, different uh, weather phenomena that happened across the country. So what was it that we could plan for and still meet the needs of what our um, 
our, our community had, as well as our, our external customers, as well as our internal. And what we looked at doing was transitioning from console computers to laptops. The laptops provided a, a variety of uh, mobility um, opportunities for us as they related to training and operations. We had people test um, their computers by taking their computers home with them and the larger screens that we had for our permit reviews, taking that home, work from home for a day or two, and then people would feed that back into our plan and how we could sit there when something did occur that we were ready for action. And again, I'm one of 14 different departments in our city. Uh, other departments did not uh, look at doing this. This was just something that uh, I wanted to beta test, uh, provide it up to the mayor and, and see if others could uh, learn from our, our mistakes and, and, and move on forward. The second thing we wanted to do is move from a, or transition from a server-based permitting and maintenance solution to something that was uh, more agile, uh, cloud-based. Uh, there was not a whole lot of ownership from our particular staff as it related to the old systems. Uh, they were bought during the economic downturn in 2008-9. No training was provided with it, and it was just a tool that folks didn't, didn't really desire to do. So we went out looking for a, a cloud-based system with that. We ended up working with uh, Dude Solutions um, for our maintenance uh, solution as far as work orders, preventative maintenance, capital improvement program. And uh, we started with that, and then we started with another company um, out of Paulsbo, Washington, that ultimately ended up getting, ironically, bought out by Dude Solutions uh, for our permitting software. And we were very pleased that, uh, again, uh, great experience on the maintenance side of the house so that when we transitioned into the permitting side, I knew what to expect from a customer uh, service perspective and that agility that's been uh, provided by the cloud. Uh, other things that we integrated was, uh, you know, the use of iPhone or Android or tablet systems. Again, at the end of the day, I did not care what system we used other than it was something that was mobile and some, something that somebody felt comfortable with. If somebody was comfortable with an Android, why am I giving them a tablet? And if I gave them an Android, why am I giving them an iPhone? You know, whatever they wanted to use, use, because the systems were all compatible with them, the cloud-based ones. The other thing that we wanted to integrate too was electronic plan review. So we uh, were very interested in making sure that when we got our permitting solution that we had Bluebeam, which is an electronic plan review tool uh, that could be utilized for that so that again, we were reducing our paper. That was the big piece that we were trying to do. Uh, we bought new, larger monitors, uh, more capable keyboards, you name it, we bought it. And I found the money within in, internal to our budget. I didn't have to ask anybody for it. Everybody was willing within their divisions to, to offer up money in order to go ahead and buy into this solution that, quite frankly, we all you know, helped create. Uh, we upgraded our conference rooms that we conduct a lot of our pre-application meetings, construction meetings, maintenance meetings. Uh, with a state-of-the-art communication suite. We had uh, training aids, uh, smart boards, uh, you name it, we, I was able to find it. Like I mentioned, my job is to train staff and equip, and I made sure that our, our folks had the tools to do what they needed to do. And I'll let you know, the reflection back was uh, significant um, as far as time, energy, people really seeing and buying into the process. Um, again, I talk about you train like we fight uh, mentality. Uh, we, we complete training uh, weekly. Uh, we do it on either Thursday or Friday. Um, we do about two to three hours just to sharpen our skills as far as it relates to utilizing our, uh, our processes, and then it, it does add to a continuous process improvement. Now, I had the misfortune of working for a four-star admiral that I believe process improvement equated to um, uh, dissatisfaction. Uh, he wasn't really too happy about much of anything. Um, that's not the case here. These sessions are, you could be the custodian to the permit tech, you know, which is like the entry uh, positions here and have just as much say in, in what goes on than I do as the, as the director. So again, that was one of the things that we, uh, we looked at. And then we, we did a lot of contingency planning, you know, what if, asking the why. Why, why are we doing this? What, what benefit does it have? And from those, um, we integrated those into a lessons learned process. So again, in my uh, time in the military, uh, I was a pilot by trade. Uh, you know, we would brief a mission. 
you execute the mission, you debrief the mission. Again, you know, nothing rocket science here, uh, but that type of formula works and that process works. Uh, some people would call it a OODA loop, you know, and, uh, you know, you incorporate those lessons learned and then you start right back at the, the briefing of the mission. And those things really worked very well. So we had an opportunity to actually try everything out before COVID hit and the governor out here in Washington State shut things down. So that's kind of just a basic background there. Other things that we did that were on the fly, so the, the work came out on March 23rd, uh, everything is shutting down, and literally people were transitioning to work from home. Um, what we needed to figure out was our pre-application meetings and some of these other meetings that we conducted were always done in person. So how do we sit there and have somebody do pre-permit type work, um, pre-application meetings? So uh, we Im immediately instituted utilization of uh, FTP sites to exchange uh, information back and forth during the pre-permit submission, same way with work orders or working with our contractors uh, on the maintenance and facility side. Uh, integrated Zoom meetings. Again, I know everybody's got some platform out there that they're doing these virtual meetings. Uh, they seem to work really well too, a good exchange of information. Again, we could socially distance and do what we needed to do from that perspective. Uh, the work from home. So we, we did institute work from home and where we're at today is just really massaging what does the employee feel comfortable with working with the guidance that's been given from CDC and state as, as far as uh, how we reintegrate the workforce? So I've got people working uh, morning shifts and then going home in the afternoon. I've got others that stay off in the morning, come in in the afternoon. Um, I've got others that work 100% uh, from home. Um, and uh, our inspectors and things, we have different things with Skype inspections that we can do for uh, a variety of uh, residential. On the commercial side, we have one of our inspectors that will come in and actually go on site uh, with those wearing all the PPE that's required. Um, permit payments, all on SmartGov on the portal. So again, what we've seen is probably about a 98% reduction in use of paper. We've seen almost 100% of a uh, uh, electronic pay uh, going through the portal, and then uh, our inspections and everything have, like I said, either worked via Skype, which was 100%, and then as the governor uh, started uh, the reopening process or the restart process, we've we've reintegrated that and just kind of working through each phase of, of those things. On the maintenance side of the house, same way working with our contractors and work orders. Um, those folks uh, are still here working. We've, we've come up with a variety of different cleaning options, PPE supplies, and then we're really working now on already pre-staged items so that when the governor does give the word that we can reopen, we've got a variety of things from social distancing signage uh, uh, spots. Uh, we've got stanchions so that we can separate folks uh, if they do need to do uh, work face-to-face -face and a variety of other things. So kind of an in-depth uh, answer there to a pretty short question, but nonetheless, that's what we did. That's great. I'm going to put you on the spot, Chris, real quick. Um, you know, pretend. Let's you know, pretend for a second you guys didn't go through that process a year or two ago. You know, you, you hadn't done the efficiency and the and, and the optimization in, in your in your processes. Knowing what you know, what what do you think would have been the first thing you did? If, if you hadn't have been prepared? Like what, what do you think would have been analyzing current? Do you think it would have been going mobile? What do you think would have been your, you know, with your knowledge, what would have been your first move? Yeah, that would have been really tough to do the work from home uh, because, again, you know, uh, what employees, I know most people have uh, computers at home or, or, or they may, um, but it, it really would have been like other municipalities that were in the county that we're in. They completely shut yeah. down weeks. Uh, they were shut down for a week or two and then slowly but surely kind of figured things out with, okay, hey, let's uh, let's see what we can do in this regard. And, I, and I'll let you know, a lot of those partners uh, we were working with and they're like going, how are you guys open? And then we shared with them some of the protocols that we had thought about and then they made it work from their perspective with the tools they had. Again, if if my folks didn't have laptops to go undock, take home, and not lose anything or to be able to tie into um, our, uh, a variety of servers and drives uh, you know, remotely, that really would have shut down pretty much everything. 
Yeah, absolutely. Well, good. Well, I've got a little bit of, uh, of background, a little bit of data before we get into this next question. Um, so just to kind of give some context here, this is some recent studies that have come out, some uh, analysis of kind of the workforce. And it's the first time in, uh, in our history, and for anybody that's alive right now, that we've had five generations currently working in the workforce right now. Um, there's a whole new kind of approach that has to be done for millennials that did not work for older generations, um, even as, you know, the, the newer Z and everybody else is starting to come into the workforce. So some interesting statistics. Um, by next year, 25% of the workforce will be Generation Z. Um, that's the people after the millennials. Uh, 21 to 25, those are the people that want to be mentored. What's interesting about this, everybody expects that, right, the new young employees they want to be mentored you know what the second most common or, or number one or uh, group that wants to be mentored is the people 50 and over right that fourth and fifth generation and what they want to be mentored on is what the 21 to 25 year olds know technology process data things like that so there's a great kind of symbiotic relationship between the older and the younger because they can both learn a lot from each other um, the biggest problem that folks are having or that, that this study particularly found was communication, bad internal communication, where I need to be, what I'm supposed to be doing, how I, my results get analyzed, my input, things like that. My question to you, Chris, is obviously everybody was different. You know, all lockdowns, you mentioned the Washington went to state of emergency. So how, how did that impact your team? Um, was it emotional? Was it tough for them? How did, they, how did they deal with it? What did that do for some of your kind of normal day-to-day, -day, kind of knowing that you had your processes in place? Was it really just kind of kicking the plan off, or what, what did that look like for you when it actually happened? Yeah, great point. Hey, one thing back to that last slide you had, too, is uh, yeah. that we have a multi-generational workforce here. Um, I got one guy that's probably a little bit older than I am. Um, you know, I'm, I'm 56. And I tell you what, I when we do our hiring, like I said, it's a small organization. I saw some folks have got a state, you know, so I'm sure you're you're much larger than what I am. But I've had an opportunity to work in those large organizations as well, and having a, a peer mentorship program really works. Uh, I feel sorry for the millenn or the Gen Zs that, and we have two of them because, much like my young adults that are uh, are out there in the workforce. I lean on them very heavily. Uh, it's really a great relationship, you know. I mean, I go in there and I just let them know, look, I heard of this, but I don't know how it actually works. And to be able to sit at their workstation to have them show me what's going in or in their office and show me, or to go into the conference room and have the, uh, you know, our smart board up there and have them walk me through what's going on and understand, it just gives me a better foundation and understanding of what it is that they're going through. If I can understand that, like I said, at the end of the day, it helps me when I get back to that mantra of train staff and equip. What training do they need? What equipment do they need? Oh, yeah, I remember that when you showed me that. Is that how this works? And then being able to, you know, provide the proof in the pudding like when the budget gets passed that they're actually getting money to go do those particular things because I can see the value that it brings to the team. So, anyway, just thought that was a little no, segue. That's good. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, so let's yeah, to answer, answer your, yeah, to answer your question here, you know, uh, what we ended up doing was because of in the permitting and in our uh, workflow, so from the construction aspect of it, w the, basically the stay home was you're not doing anything with outside contractors. So any of the internal work that we could do from work orders and preventative maintenance pieces, that's where the emphasis was with the facilities team. We got in there, got into the outstanding work orders, what we could do. Most of the hardware stores and everything, especially the big boxes, are open, so we always knew we had supplies. That, that was not going to be an issue. It was making sure the workspace was clean for those area, you know, for those folks that would be working here uh, as we were learning more about COVID and, and, and what it was doing within our workspaces. So, I mean, we literally bought, you know, atomizers to, to spray areas so the workspaces were all clean. You know, we go through the workspaces four times a day. We gave uh, cleaning supplies to individual folks who were working there as well as departmental so that everybody had it. And then that supply chain was just a quick email to me uh, or using our uh, work order. Just put in what you need and we'll make sure you get it. So that was one thing on the work order side or dealing with our, our maintenance. On the permitting side, we had about three or four. We were going gangbusters prior prior to March 23rd. I mean, we had we were we were on scale to be like in a 2004-5 time frame. 
as far as the amount of work coming in from residential and from our uh, uh, commercial activity. So, I mean, we were going gangbusters. So we had about three to four weeks worth of work just internal to the system that we were doing while our partners were trying to figure out what they were going to do, which was much like I talked, like we talked about. Some were able to just undock and go home. Others still worked in the office, and they were trying to still figure out what this stay-home order was and what we could do. After about that three- to four-week period of time, um, the mayor came down to us, uh, departments. Uh, I was one of them. Uh, that We had about a $5.5 million uh, deficit in our budget. Um, as you would imagine, the biggest uh, money um, or revenue stream we have coming in is, comes from our sales tax. Another part of that is property taxes. Uh, on the sales tax side, we took or were anticipating to take a fairly significant hit and the mayor needed to do something immediately, although the county and the state, I still don't figure out how they have, I mean, there's, their hole is, is, is higher in the millions, and our state is actually in the billions, and they haven't laid off or furloughed anybody. So not exactly sure, not judging, but I'm like going, you know, we, we took immediate action um, to go ahead, and I, my staff was reduced by a third. So we furloughed one-third of our staff right after we got caught up. And then what I've been doing is tracking data uh, and being able to show the number of inspections that are required. And once we hit a threshold, I was able to bring back one of my building inspectors. Um, when it came to permit intake and when we saw the increase going there, you know, we were able to bring someone back. What ended up happening was as we've gone through phase one of the restart and phase two of the restart, um, permanently I had to lay off or I had to lay off three people or fire three people. So there is a new normal. So again, from like external communication to our partners, I let them know straight up, you know, we've been, we lost three people and then the remaining staff who were not furloughed, that first third I talked about, the other two thirds, we have to go on furlough, um, unpaid leave for 56 hours, basically uh, seven work days um, that we have to take between now and the end of the year in order to assist and help with that 5.3 to $5.5 million deficit. So not necessarily a real good time in the department, especially when you got to give somebody who was an active, valuable team player that their services were no longer needed. So that's basically where we were uh, through phase one uh, and phase two. And as far as like where we are as far uh, with, uh, I'm sorry, our um, normal processes and workflows, what we've tried to uh, demonstrate to our folks and looking at the data that SmartGov does provide, I can see the time that it takes to go through for each different type of permit. And my job in this regard is I'm, I'm the front person. I'm the one calling the customer. If things are going to take longer, uh, if things are going to be a week more, I know time is money for them now, especially since we are in phase two, which means it's almost like normal construction. I've got to be able to sit there and, and do the customer facing and let them know the why behind what we're doing, why our staff has really functioned internally to making sure that they're processing these things. So again, very good symbiotic relationship, roles, responsibilities within our team, and then discussing, again, cliche, that new normal now that you know, we've lost three people, who's covering down, where are we going, and as we're working through folks being furloughed, you know, I tell them, leave their computer here, leave their phones here. You know, we got to show the pain. we got to show what the impact of this is so that our development community and our community partners can then leverage the council members and the mayor and do all the things they need to do to voice their opinion because if it's important for them, we'll be able to add that staff back. And if it's not, we're doing the best that we can and then our, our job is to inform those decision makers as best we can, here are the facts, and then you know, let, them, let them fall where they may as far as how that affects our level of service. So did I, and Chris, did I hear you correctly that you said as soon as the kind of the, I don't wanna say the day came, but as soon as you kind of had that knowledge, you guys looked at kind of the backlog, figured out what needed to be done now before you did furloughs, and then once you did those furloughs, did you already have a metric in place to say once we get back up to this level, we bring them back? Was that all preset? Uh, the permitting part, yes. We were able to go into SmartGov and figure out how much 
time that we were going to need there, which I let, let the mayor and the council know that, yeah, we got about three and a half weeks' worth of work. And when I was checking with our group, you know, pretty much on a weekly basis, I'm not a micromanager, so it was on a weekly basis, meeting with the managers, you manage by walking around. I, I was getting word from folks, and I let them know what was probably going to happen. So, I mean, I'm, I'm very straight up. What you see is what you get. And uh, I, I figured people would respect that. And, and, and for the most part, uh, I would say that of the 16 folks uh, out of 18, you know, were, were probably, or maybe a little more than that, were on board and understood. You know, it's nothing personal. It, it, it really is business. But I want to be able to inform them as well so they can make decisions uh, because of their families and, and what was going on, again, with uh, I'm sure everybody has possibly seen on the national news, you know, our unemployment office out here, for whatever reason, was paying people without actually verifying, and there was somewhere between 300 and 500 million dollars lost to somewhere, I, I believe it was over in Nigeria, uh, the Nigerian prince, you know, those emails that come out, uh, that supposedly that's that's where our, our money over here had gone. They supposedly recovered uh, about half of that, but the other half that you haven't seen much in the papers anymore. Um, but to get back to this, yeah, it was one of those things where once that work was done, I thought it was my duty, really, to let the mayor know I'm not going to have people sitting around doing nothing that we came up with a game plan of, hey, let's furlough these people. I understand you need you know, savings. I can do that, but I need, when I come to you and say, hey, I'd like to bring these folks back, I need assurances that I can make that happen, or there will be a change, to a significant impact to the level of service that's being provided to our community and our developers, again, that are paying into the system. So, and again, you know, affordable housing is an issue, um, you know, commercial activity is an issue. I mean, there's a variety of things that, that, that this construction does for our community, and we want to make sure that we're being good stewards. So, like I said, my, my job is just to provide the facts, and when asked for options, to provide those options. So the answer to your second question is yes. I already had the uh, metrics that I was able to pull from, uh, from SmartGov to put into the system. I have three reports that come out. Uh, every Monday, I enter them into uh, easily to take them out from that into a spreadsheet and then graphically displaying it because people love the pictures, and I can show them, okay, here are your decisive points going in there. Now, again, I'm just uh, trying to be a good bureaucrat here, um, so I, hopefully others are laughing out there, uh, is that when <laughs> here's, here's the... Here is the here's the information. At the end of the day, you know, uh, leadership, this is your call. What do you want to do? And then I will reflect that out to the community. If you want me to change the level of service, you could bet my email's going out to the 90 plus development uh, folks that I meet with on a on a monthly basis and let them know. Here's what's happening. You know, I don't have to like it. I just need to make sure that again, if it's not immoral, it's not unethical, and it's not unlawful, I'm going to carry out your plan. Um, but again, it's just information, good, bad, or indifferent. Just make sure the info gets out there. Have they? Has your council always been receptive to data and using it? Um, I talked to a lot of people whose council, at the end of the day, for whatever reason, seem to just not care. Have they always been receptive, or has that grown as your data abilities um, have grown? I would say that my first year here, um, I was new, so I didn't need to actually have to contract out to have somebody come in and tell them the same thing that I would tell them. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? A lot of times it's like now, we, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm part of the uh, indoctrinated into the crew now, so in order to do something, we got to spend thirty or $40,000 to go have somebody come in, look at the data, and provide them the information versus me doing it. But when I was in that honeymoon stage, uh, you know, for that first year, you know, I could do no wrong. Uh, and it was just a matter of setting those good fundamental practices in there that at the end of the day, you know, I'm used to doing, again, my military background. I was used, I've worked at the Pentagon. I've been in command. I've also worked as a chief of staff. It's just the facts. Here you go. Be unemotional about it. Try to put your plan out there. Let them see it. And, again, at the end of the day, if it's, again, not illegal, immoral, or unlawful, got it, you know. Hey, I'm not going to take it personally. I'm going to go out there and smack my golf balls after work. I'm going to go and work out and do my thing, um, but at the end of the day, um, you know, I'm getting paid to be able to provide them that info. So, again, yeah, they, they were receptive to it. I think they still are now uh, with all of that. Uh, for, the, for the facility folks out there, you know, my facility budget here was like $50,000 for facility renewal. Uh, when I did the initial assessment, we had over $20 million in deferred maintenance. 
and the way of fixing things here was let's wait for it to break. I mean, that, that is the worst uh, management facility maintenance uh, plan out there. Uh, the next year, after I showed them all the data, we had a half million dollars in our budget in an enterprise-type fund, so they couldn't touch it, you know, so it has to be used for facilities. Uh, and, uh, you know, depending on how our budget years go, you know, I've had anywhere from uh, 400 to a half a million uh, this past year. Again, budget got tight, so I was down to $200,000 in there, slowly but surely just kind of whittling down uh, that 15 or $20 million worth of deferred maintenance that needs to be done. So if I'm understanding it right, I know this is, yeah, no, exactly. And I, if, if I'm understanding it right, and I think this is a, a tough one for a lot of people, is whether your quote-unquote boss, whoever it is you report to, whether they use the information in the way that you want them to or make the choice that you think is right, you're only concerned with providing them the right information. You're, you're not focusing on whether they make the right choice. Obviously, you want them to, but that's not your role. I, 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 yes, that is not my role now. When I was the commanding officer, I, I was on the other side of it. I had my staff. That's, right. that's how I wanted it done. And then, uh, you know, uh, would, would make those decisions if I needed to. So, yeah, very comfortable in either way. Like I said, the biggest thing is you want folks to take it personal, but you don't want them to take it personally. You know what I mean? When I leave work yeah. every day at 5 o'clock, I feel perfectly 100% fine that I did my best job that I could do and then I'm off doing my doing my thing, you know. But uh, while I'm here, hey, you, you're paying me not to sugarcoat things and, and just be a yes man. I love it. Oops, I'm hey, sorry. We, we I didn't mean to offend any. I didn't mean to offend anybody. I didn't want to be a yes person. Sorry about that. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And and you, you kind of answered the first half of this already, so I'll just I'll edit this question a little bit. But you know, your short and mid range plan we talked about with the, with the furlough and bringing people back. Um, what about long range? I mean, what what do you think that has happened in the past three months that's going to affect you guys moving forward for years? Any any specifics that you can give in terms of a of a long term plan or long term outlook? Yeah, I, I thought about this one uh, good and hard when when you gave me the questions the other day, and just just really thinking about this one. You know, it, it's almost like playing whack a mole. Or one of my favorite movies, Forrest Gump. You know, you're opening up the box of chocolates, and and what's it going to be today? You know, and in that light, it's, you know, talking to my staff is because they were feeling very frustrated because the amount of work to be done is just growing. And I said, but do you control that? You know, am I coming down here and sitting on you telling you you got to crank this out? And they're like, well, no. I said, well, then you pass that burden on to me. You know, you do the best you can do with what you have and let me be the one to worry about that you just need to let me know what the, pro you know, as we're sharing information back and forth, we'll discuss and I'll let you know what the priorities are, but it'll be a mutually agreed upon way forward, you know, because I don't want them going home or thinking they have to last, you know, work longer than what they do. In my opinion, we got to be able to show the pain, you know, which in my Navy time, we really never did a good job at. We always, you know, you salute, you say aye, aye, and you carry out the plan of the day. Well, Different mindset here. I, like I said, when I was a city administrator, I was working Navy hours. I was I was pumping about anywhere between 100 and uh, probably 130 hours a week into the job. And quite frankly, that's it, it, it's a different transition. So this is where, with my team here, I've just talked to them about that. So, for instance, you know, phone calls that we used to answer immediately, we let the development community know, hey, it's going to be about 48 hours before we can get back to you, just because of the amount of work that we got going on. Non-technical questions, we created a, a format for them to utilize that, but that could be anywhere from 48 hours to a week. But you know what? That used to happen every day. So it's really changing those expectations or that expectation management. You know, technical questions, again, depending on are the technical questions associated with a permit or a work order that's already in the system, obviously they will have priority over somebody just asking, hey, well, what about this? Uh, and, and then having to, they don't have to like it either, the community. They just have to understand. That's my job is to be able to effectively communicate to them that this is the new, the new normal. This is the way that it is going to be. 
So from the long-term perspective, again, what do I control in that? Well, since I'm not in D.C., thank God, and that was one of the reasons I retired. They, they threatened me with a job back in D.C., and I was like, God, I cannot go back to the Pentagon again. For those in D.C., love the city, daughter lives there, but did not want to go work in the five-sided building anymore. Uh, or the governor. The governor here, I mean, the, the, it, the goalpost changes. I mean, one day, uh, and I'm not being uh, trying to indict anybody, but if you recall back three months ago, don't wear a face mask. Don't wear a cloth mask. Don't, don't, don't. And now, because they've learned things, hey, it's wear a face mask. You know, and some people get frustrated. Well, why are they changing all this sort of thing? Control what you can control. If it's wear a face mask and the medical folks say this is the reasons and rationale why, getting upset or voicing your opinion, does it really make any sense? And the answer is no. So wear the face mask when you need to and go about carrying out the plan of the day. Hopefully that helps. So on the long range, man, we're just waiting to see what happens, and then we'll adjust fire with the team as it comes on. Perfect. And, Chris, we're getting some great questions that are coming in, so I'm going to skip a couple of the pre, pre-cam ones so we can get to the audience. Oh, questions. sure, man. We do yeah. have two more I want to, want to, yeah, want to make sure we cover. Um, so I just want to share this interesting stat with the, uh, uh, with the audience. When, uh, when, we, when COVID first hit, we started tracking metrics on our end on the dude solution side. And uh, amazing, the, you know, 5X increase, 5,000% increase in, in uh, different activities related to things like sanitize, um, you know, actually having the word COVID or virus in, in different activities or work orders um, has increased greatly. So it's a lot of different, uh, different changes, different processes. So I think the one, one that I want to ask you about here, you can go back. Here we go. If you could have predicted this, because obviously the things that you did, you did without, and there's one of the questions we'll talk about, you did this without COVID on your mind. So if you could go back, having everything at your disposal, um, anything you would have done differently? Would you have done any preparation beforehand? Any any key things that might be uh, useful to talk about there? Yeah, I think the one thing I, I think about is like on the on the PPE side. So for anybody out there that deals with emergency management, um, you know, you have these boxes that I used to call uh, in my Navy days, you know, a, a to-go box. I mean, and in it you had all the critical items you would need in order to stand up a, an emergency operations center or to do something in that regard. I think uh, that's probably one thing that we've done now. And we used to do it with, uh, or we still do, with our first aid type items, I think it, I would have probably uh, taken a little bit more on board from when people were asking, well, what about, what about, and it was really just having on, on station safety glasses or um, the face masks or gloves and things of that nature, just so that each department would have at least a, a maybe a, a daily use or a weekly use of having those, those supplies available for them. Um, you know, just in case, and, and that, that's probably the one thing that, that, that jumps out at me. The other thing is a ready store locker of other, like the cleaning supplies, because when people started increasing the cleaning side of the house, I mean, we had a small locker. Uh, I'm not saying hoard, not, not, not like the toilet paper, um, but, you know, maybe having a, a bigger ready locker of, uh, of things to kind of keep things going more than like one or two days that maybe a week is probably a better, maybe a better metric to use so that, again, you're not stressing the supply system. Um, and then lastly, you know, uh, you know, flexibility, you know, being, being the key, you know, uh, one of the things like Semper Gumby, you know, always flexible. You know, there's got to be reasons and rationale how, how things evolve, and I think that that's really um, a, a very important part. I think another one, too, just because of the folks that I had to lay off, um, you know, communication being, being key, and even in today's age uh, of what we're seeing across our country, I'm just going to use one, empathy. You know, empathy. Try to understand a point of view from someone else. And I'll share with the crowd out here, I'm nowhere near an expert on race, and it has absolutely nothing to do with what we're talking today. But empathy is a huge impact. I've been fortunate. I've been married to my wife for 32 years. She's African-American. I've got two biracial kids, one son, one, one daughter, 125 is the son, and 22. And being able to 
convey to them as a white man what it is like and being able to listen to my son with the experiences that he's having he's an officer in the navy across the country and what he's you know being able to prepare him for that as best i could that's all i i I really bring out of everything that's happening in the country today is empathy just being able to listen and try to understand from somebody else's point of view it's the golden rule on steroids try to put yourself in somebody else's position and empathize and understand how they're feeling, and then being able to put that into action. Uh, I I do that with my staff all the time with, again, like I say, flattening the organization to figure out what is the best way to handle this situation, and then being able to sit there and go, okay, I'm, I'm used to chain of command. You don't have to worry about giving orders. I'm used to that or listening to them, you know. Uh, I get it. But that idea of flattening the organization, making yourself vulnerable, listening to folks, it is just the strategic imperative that I think some people in leadership are, are not willing to do. And I'm just saying, if you're in a leadership position and you're on this call, make yourself vulnerable. Listen. Sorry for the soapbox. No, I'm actually going to shift and, and take an audience question right now because I think it's very relevant. So I'm going to read kind of the remarks here, and I want you to uh, to kind of give your input on them. I think empathy is going to be part of your answer. But um, what what somebody mentioned here was that the, the people that get furloughed are very marketable folks. Um, oftentimes, they do not have issues finding employment. Um, and, you know, when they do, there goes all your corporate knowledge, expertise. They're probably getting paid more money. Um, you know, it's very likely that they, you know, being furloughed, it's nice to be able to get them back, but oftentimes are leaving, jumping ship. A lot of that has to do with loyalty, right? The loyalty you show and, and, and kind of what, how they feel about going back to work for you. Can you talk a little bit about that, kind of how that was addressed or how you kind of respond to that, that idea? I think it's very Whoever is very the cla- Whoever's the clairvoyant person on the line, great question because I just did this yesterday. So one of the folks that we, I've always been about, okay, so we're a very flat organization. You know, literally for someone to get promoted, someone's either retiring or dying. You know, I mean, that's, that's really about it. The small place that we live in, quality of life out here is awesome, and people don't really move very often. Um, one of the things I will let you know is that the individual that I'm talking about um, was a planning coordinator. She had completed all of her permit tech duties, and she was aspiring to be a building official. Um, and again, all the training that was associated with that over the last two and a half years, I was all in. I knew the likelihood of her being a building official in the city of Mount Vernon was probably nil. But my responsibility as a leader to her was to make her the best she could be and to make herself marketable for upward mobility. And she passed her building. uh, I furloughed her. (laughs) She was furloughed and then permanently laid off. Um, She came in last Friday, took her building uh, official exam, passed it, all three sections of it. She sent me her resume and her cover letter today because a municipality that's located about 25 minutes to a half an hour south of us is hiring someone. I've already been on the phone with their planning director or director of development services via email and phone call. I've already uh, reviewed her uh, resume and edited her her resume as well as her cover letter uh, to the point of printing out the job description and making sure all the key words that were in that job description reflected in her resume and so forth. So it is incumbent upon leadership, especially in a flat organization like this, that you know, they're not most likely going to be able to get promoted within your group. It could happen, but let's say that it doesn't. Isn't it your job as a leader to take care of your people and ensure that they are marketable and are effective as as best they can? They may have to move out, but maybe she comes back and takes my job in five years, you know, when I'm ready to retire or whenever my wife tells me I can retire. You know, that's the idea. That's how you grow, uh, I think, um, marketable employees, and it's a value statement that I am 100% committed to with our staff. I've got other staff that are in similar positions that I am training and ensuring uh, and working with, especially when it comes to 
Uh, I've got some background, again, in uh, um, a variety of other, I got a few master's degrees, which is dangerous, but nonetheless, I sit down and talk with them because it's about the soft skills. How do you communicate with people? How do you effectively implement change when people do not want to change? To me, it's an art. You need to be able to understand that because you're going you're gonna to feel that, uh, that tension, if you will, healthy tension that's out there. So hopefully that answers the question. Good. Yeah, absolutely. And, and Chris, I'm just going to jump in. We have more questions coming in than we have time, so let's dive into them. Um, you got it. Hopefully this one will be, will be nice and quick. What, what methods are you using to sterilize laptops and handouts? So uh, what we were doing there is uh, I've worked with our IS department. Our IS department has whatever the uh, cleaning solution that they provide. Uh, it's in a squirt bottle. We take care of the keyboards, the mouse, or the mice uh, with those. And then for our uh, screens, uh, we have some other product that IS has provided us. Uh, if people want to email me with what we're using, uh, once we get off of this, I'd be more than happy to, to, to let you guys know what we're using. But that's basically as We wanted to make sure it was something that was approved by IS but also killed the germs. Perfect. I think you mentioned barriers and some, some stickers on the ground. But are yeah. you using anything else for lobbying and yeah, so, so Yeah. So as far as social distancing goes, in all of our municipal buildings, when we're ready to open up, uh, we purchased uh, stanchions so that you could basically kind of do some crowd control. Uh, we also got um, uh, floor mats that uh, basically allow for social distancing. So, you know, much like if you go to Home Depot or Lowe's, you know, stand on the dot, you know, and, that, and we're measuring them out six feet. Uh, we have sneeze guards for any of the customer-facing uh, groups that are around. Uh, for us, uh, after every use, oh, I have an employee and a departmental checklist that we utilize, and we, we've taken this through two or three organizations at the state level that have basically given us thumbs up. So if anybody out there in the, uh, and that wants to get a hold of that, uh, my email is C Phillips, C as in Charlie, P as in Papa, H as in Hotel, India, Lima, Lima, India, Papa Sierra, at Mount Vernon, all one word, WA, Whiskey Alpha, dot gov. Shoot me an email. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. I'll give you anything you need to get your program going. I think you're going to get some email. Um, okay. <laughs> so, because a couple of questions, and I'll, I'll, we'll talk about it a little bit, but I'm sure people can get more more via the email process. But this one here, I thought was a nice one. Um, when you started at the beginning, you said that when you when you started there two years ago, you you put processes into place. Obviously, you didn't even know COVID existed back then. What were the factors that that, that determined you needed to begin the process that you did? Oh, right on. So what we did was, um, like I said, it could be any act of God. I, I used a snowstorm. So a snowstorm or a windstorm, which out in Washington State happened rather frequently. Um, so what happens if we're shut down for a week? I mean, are we really shut down for a week? So what we looked at is we put protocols in place that, uh, you know, prior to the day, it's my job to sit there and look at the weekend uh, or the, the outcome for weather, you know. So I'm going to look at the forecast, figure out what's going on. And if for some reason it looks like we have a snow event or a wind event that's coming, I will sit there and tag hey, guys, let's undock, take your stuff home, do this, and let's just plan to execute our, our plan. And, again, it was affectionately called Operation Chrysanthemum. Don't read anything into it. it I'm, you know, it's just something we came up with. So when it was like, hey, you know, I'd have people coming through the office, and, hey, are we executing Operation Chrysanthemum? The answer would be like, yeah, hey, yeah, let me check out the weather. Yeah, hey, it looks like it's, a, it's favorable. It could happen. Now, again, out here, things change very much, you know, we were going to get a foot of snow and then we get a dusting or, you know, what have you. But we always had the opportunity to go ahead and plan for that. So that's exactly what we did. And then also, in, if you go through Emergency Operations Center training, FEMA training, it goes through a variety of different things that you should consider, you know, when you're, when you're conducting these type of emergency operations. Basically, what I did is I dummied it down to just our department and what we could do in there. So again, I went from volumes of things just to, you know, hey, what is the most important stuff that we need to go ahead and do? 
and then making sure, again, that we can communicate with each other. Fantastic. Yeah, great. All right. So here's here's a good one. And, and Chris, we only have four minutes left. So I know you could talk about this for an hour, but um, if you had to make a detailed reopening plan, what would it look like? Where would you start? Right on. So I would say email me and I will give you our reopening plan. It is it is, it is long and it is comprehensive. Nothing. Uh, I think our individual employee one is probably two and a half pages long, and our one for the departments to consider and post. You know, all all read boards and things like that uh, is probably about four. Shoot me an email, and like I said, I will send it to you in a Word document so that you do not have to recreate the wheel. Get rid of the Mount Vernon. Add whatever you want to do. Plagiarism is a good thing because, oh, except if you're in college for our college folks out there. If you're not in a college, plagiarism is good. Absolutely. So just to get us wrapped up here, guys, the, I do want to just let everybody on the call know that there is another webinar coming up specifically related to federal uh, funding uh, sources. Um, Chris, unfortunately, we didn't have time to kind of get into how you guys approach state and federal funding. Um, I'm sure if people email you, you've got a lot to say. So there, there is an upcoming webinar um, if anybody is interested in attending that. And I will put up one final poll before we turn it over to Otto to, uh, to wrap us up. I will put this on, uh, on the screen. And uh, Otto, if you want to give them a few seconds, and then we can uh, go ahead and wrap up. Will do. There you go, there's the poll question. Uh, select all that apply and then hit the submit button at the bottom of the poll question. And, and actually another thing, Chris, can you go through your email one more time for the folks on the call? Yeah, sure, so I'll do it in the non-Navy way. It's C-P-H-I-L-L-I-P-S, -L -L C. Phillips at Mount Vernon, M-O-U-N-T-V-E-R-N-O-N-W-A dot gov, G-O-V. All right, and I thank everybody for answering that uh, question. And, um, you know, I want to be respectful of our time commitments today, so we're going to have to wrap it up here. Uh, in closing, I would like to thank Chris Phillips and Luke Anderson for sharing their insights on today's uh, webcast. I'd also like to thank our sponsor, uh, Dude Solutions, for making it possible to have this important webcast discussion today. And thanks to our audience for spending the hour with us. We look forward to seeing you again at another government technology event. Take care, everyone, and stay safe.